All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm Tracy Bates. I'm the chief curator here with the Interior Museum. And after being on hiatus last month, it's great to be back uh, here with our lecture series. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. As many of you know, this lecture series encompasses a, a very wide range of topics, historical, environmental, scientific, to really reflect the diverse workings of our bureaus and the Department of the Interior as a whole, past and present. And today's presentation is no exception. Uh, before we get started, I did want to draw your attention to the fact that um, you all have in your seats with you um, a feedback form, and we encourage you to fill those out and deposit them in the tray uh, outside at the end of the lecture. Your input really does help us make this series the best that it can be. Um, and in terms of lectures coming up, in March we'll be hearing from two conservators with the National Park Service's Harper's Ferry Center. They'll be speaking on some fascinating and recent restoration projects of national treasures that have taken them throughout the country. And in April, Douglas Peter from BESI, uh, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, will be joining us to talk about their Rigs to Reefs program, where decommissioned oil and gas platforms are repurposed into artificial reefs, supporting an abundance of marine life. Uh, we've also reached back out to our speakers from January about rescheduling the talk that was waylaid by the shutdown. Um, they were going to be giving that on sea turtle biologging uh, projects in the Gulf of Mexico, so look for that to come back on a future uh, schedule for us as well. But turning to today's presentation and today's presenter, uh, Peter McGowan is a senior wildlife biologist who's been with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in their Chesapeake, field office, Chesapeake Bay field office in Annapolis for more than 25 years. He has an associate degree in environmental studies, bachelor's of science degree in biology, and a master's of science in environmental science and policy. His professional career has involved investigations of contaminants and their effects on water birds. He's done considerable oil spill planning and response both within the Chesapeake Bay and elsewhere in the U.S. And over the past dozen years, he's been the lead biologist at the Paul S. Sarbanes Ecosystem Restoration Project at Poplar Island. And that's what he's going to be talking to us about today. In that role, he is charged with overseeing wildlife management activities on the island and literally converting spoil to splendor for the benefit of wildlife on this remote island habitat. So please join me in welcoming Peter McGowan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, as you can see, uh, Spoil to Splendor is a you know, story of Chesapeake Bay Island restoration, and uh, I'm going to be focusing on the uh, Paul S. Sarbanes Ecological Restoration Project at Poplar Island, Talbot County, Maryland. And uh, Paul Sarbanes was a senator from Maryland. He was instrumental in getting this project funded and authorized for uh, going ahead. Uh, from now on, I'll be just calling it Poplar Island. That's a pretty mouthful to say, right? Let's keep on going. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Poplar Island and uh, a little bit of background history, a little bit about the Port of Baltimore, which is really important, which drives this project, and the, what the role of the Fish and Wildlife Service is in this project. So some, you know, some facts about Baltimore. It's one of the oldest ports in, in, um, in the country, over 300 years old. And it's one of three East Coast ports that have a 50-foot channel. And it's that 50-foot depth that drives this project. The, the big ships need to come in to the Port of Baltimore to uh, un unload and take on uh, cargo. That needs to be maintained at that 50-foot channel. That's one of the you know, busiest ports. It's, uh, in 2015, it was ranked the 13th busiest. And most of the cargo that does come onto the, uh, into, into the port is roll-on, roll-off cargo. It's a lot of uh, vehicles, uh, trucks, tractors, and things of that nature. But other types of materials do come in, like aggregate, sand, rock, and stuff like that. But you can, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but it, you can get an idea of how important the Port of, Bol Bordem, port of Baltimore is to the state of Maryland. I mean, it's a lot of jobs involved with the port, brings in a lot of money and uh, a lot of taxes. So a little bit about the history of Poplar. It was first settled in the 1630s. Uh, the small community was on there raising livestock and crops and things of that nature, tobacco, which was a big uh, product at the time. 1637, the Nanticoke tribe visited the island while the men were away and uh, massacred the, the wife and the servants and some of the workers on the property. Uh, 1812, the War of 1812 became a British encampment in the harbor in the, uh, on the island. By the mid-1800s, the island reduced down to 1140 acres. Originally, it was around 2,000 acres, probably in the 1600s or so. Uh, in the 1800s, black cat fur was the biggest rage in China. 
some entrepreneur thought, hey, I'm gonna bring some black cats out to the island, start raising them, and I'm gonna make some money, some quick money. Well, they froze over. All the cats left the island and went to the mainland. So the myth is that's why there's so many black cats on Tilma. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's got some plausibility. By the late 1800s, the island started breaking up into, into three small islands. There was still an active community on the island, uh, fishing and farming community. It had its own post office, uh, it had a school, small school, it had a general store, 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 and it also had a sawmill. Part of that sawmill was logging the island, and those trees were actually holding that island together. Once the trees were gone, it started rapidly disappearing. By the 1920s, residents had left the island, and it was bought by a democratic uh, politicians, and it was used as a retreat to get away from, from Washington. Nice peaceful retreat. Uh, in fact, Presidents Roosevelt and Truman had visited the island quite a bit. Uh, by the 1940s, uh, Poplar was sold to the former caretaker of the island and became a hunting retreat. Uh, let's, oh, I'll forget that one. So what is Poplar Island today? So it's a 40-year project uh, using beneficial use material from the dredge uh, deposits from uh, the approach channels of Baltimore, and they have to maintain that 50-foot channel. It's actually an international model for uh, island restoration. We've had a lot of folks coming from uh, the Netherlands, China, Japan. They're all interested in doing similar projects at their respective countries. And one of the primary focuses is to provide high quality island habitat, both upland and wetland, for wildlife use. And the primary driver is uh, colonial water birds and other bird species. Uh, construction just began in 1998 with a rock perimeter, and it was broken up into subunits. It's expected to be completed in 2043. And it also includes an expansion project that's going to add another additional 570 acres to the north end of the island. I have a lot of aerials, and I'll show you some side by side comparisons. So you can imagine a project of this scope has a lot of partners are involved. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, funds 75% of the project, and the Maryland Port Administration provides the other 25%. And the day-to-day -day operations are conducted uh, by the Maryland Environmental Service. So they're responsible for getting the contractors on site, making sure materials move to the appropriate areas on the island, and construction is done accordingly. Um, there's some other federal agencies involved, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's our role in there for wildlife management. We work really closely with USGS, Patuxent and Wildlife Research Center for Evening Monitoring. Uh, NOAA does a lot of the fisheries work out there. We also have a number of uh, universities that are working out there too. University of Maryland, Horn Point Lab does a lot of the wetland and sediment chemistry work out there. We work closely with those guys. And Ohio University has a very active diamondback terrapin program out there where they'll tag all the terrapin nests and they'll capture young, tag them, and then uh, I think it's like two go to each of the schools in Anne Arundel County and the kids get to do actual science. They'll raise the, the terrapins in the classroom and they'll come back in, at the end of the school season and release their, their terrapins. And it's called the Head Start Program, and by the time they release them, those terrapins are the size of a three-year-old terrapin in the wild. So it's a pretty successful uh, program. And we have a list of other, other uh, universities that have done some minor work out there. So, you know, why bother with a project like this? Well, we lost over 10,000 acres in the mid-bay in the last 150 years, and that's a lot of sediment deposition in the bay. At Poplar, there were rates of up to 13 feet per year were being lost, primarily due to erosion, subsidence, which is mostly associated with you know, isostatic rebound and sea level rise. And prior to the end of the 20th century, you know, we lost greater than 500 islands in the bay. So I just imagine that's a big loss. Uh, not only was it a loss of you know, island wetland habitat, we lost a lot of you know, culturally significant areas, both Native American and European settlements. A lot of those have been lost to the bay. You can think of Jamestown as one of those early settlements, right? It's washed down to the river. Uh, but in, in the 1980s, Maryland outlawed overboard disposal. The, the typical technique was to go to the channel, over, dredge the channel, and overboard disposal. And you can imagine what the environmental impacts of that is, right? You got increased turbidity, you got smothering of benthic community, and things like that. So the, the 
choice was to try and create island habitats. And, you know, it's an important habitat type here in the bay. Why not try and do some island restoration? And also a lot, you know, nesting cloned water birds, for their success, they really depend on these remote island habitats. They're typically free of mammalian predators, and they, their reproductive success is much more successful when they're on these remote islands. So this is an aerial, one of the earliest known aerials of uh, poplar. You can see it right here. This is poplar right here. This is Jefferson Island, and this is Coaches. These two are uh, privately owned right now. You can see how intact it is right here. And you notice all these submerged aquatic vegetation beds right here in Tillman. Right here would, would be the Bay Bridge if it was a current issue. So Bay Bridge, and this is the southern tip of Ken Island. A little bit closer image, you can see the forest on the island, some farming areas right here. This is the pier that goes to Jefferson that became, eventually became that uh, hunting club for the, for the Democratic clubs. 1994, a lot of erosion. Islands are starting breaking up. These are those two private islands I just showed you. This island here was a, it's called Middle Poplar. It was a remnant. It was a very important heronry in the Chesapeake Bay. And a stopgap measure to try and protect this from the westward fetch was to put a semi-arc of old abandoned barges out there. And it worked really well. It held, held up until the project got underway. So today, remember those, those barges? They're right here. And that's that little remnant right here. So you can see, I mean, big difference from 1994. But just another graphical representation of, you know, island loss. From 1631 to 2000, 117 acres have been lost. And the blue represents what this was in 1847. This is the earliest known map or area that we knew what the actual acreage was. And the green represent what was there in 1993. So it's not just probably that we're losing islands. It, you know, this, this was down in Holland Island, down the lower bay. And this photo is from 1890, and you can see through the years, it's starting to dwindle down. Talk about the ultimate waterfront community, I mean, property, right? So what was kind of interesting is, I was out in June 2010, we were doing some peregrine work. I took the picture of the house, the last remaining house that was on the island. I did some digging, looking for older pictures, and this house is this house right here. It overlays perfectly, it's unbelievable. It's the same, from the same angle, I mean, not talk about luck trying to get that picture right. But in uh, 2010, we had a, a storm come through and it just washed it into the bay. All that's there now is there's an old piece of machinery out there, some shoals, but birds are still using that area. A lot of pelicans in that area. So the design features for poplar is 1,140 acres. It's going to be 50% wetlands and 50% uplands, and it's based on that 1847 footprint. We're actually adding, a, adding another additional 570 acres to the north end, which will bring it up to 1,710 acres. Uh, the marsh ratios are going to be 80% low marsh, 20% high marsh. We're actually talking about changing that ratio to more of a 50-50. As we get sea level rise, that low marsh can encroach into the, into the high marsh areas. As, if not, we're probably going to have open water impoundments in 20 years or whatever. Uh, the storage capacity for the dredge material is 68 million cubic yards, and we're presently at uh, 35 million cubic yards at present. So this is the two, this is a 2017 aerial. This is the expansion that's underway right now. This red line right here represents the Center Dyke Road. Everything to this side of it will eventually be upland forest. There'll be meadows, grassland. Uh, freshwater ponds and that nature, and they'll be draining down into these tidal salt marsh areas down here. And each one of these units is called a cell, and within these cells, we, we create what are known as habitat islands, and they're either vegetated or sparsely vegetated, depending on the type of bird species we're trying to encourage. Just another side-by-side -side comparison. October 2018, there's that remnant there's that same remnant before the construction took place. And you can see the sediment plumes coming off of these small remnants, even Coach's Island too. 
So the main goals, three primary main goals, is to restore island habitat in the Mid Chesapeake Bay using clean dredge material from the approach channels to Baltimore, optimize site capacity for clean dredge material. None of the material that comes to the island is, is, is dirty, it's not contaminated, it's pretty relatively clean. Nothing of it, nothing comes out of the Baltimore Harbor, so it, get, it does get tested. And also to protect the uh, surrounding environment where the restoration sites actually take in place. With regards to the restoration uh, goals, trying to create remote and diverse island habitat, restore quiescent water habitat in, in Poplar Harbor, and to promote submerged aquatic vegetation recovery. And I will say we do not plant any submerged aquatic vegetation. It's just creating the conditions for the, for the plants to come in, and we're starting to see that. Create enhanced tidal wetlands to provide fish and wildlife habitat. And this, this, uh, these two re refer to the, uh, the habitat islands I just mentioned. This re create remote, bare, sparsely vegetated islands within restored marshes to provide nesting habitat for ground nesting birds such as common and least terns, black skimmers, and oyster catchers. And also to create these vegetated islands where we have some, a shrub community where we can get herons and things like that and also provide cover for black, black duck, which is a focal species for us. So what's the Fish and Wildlife Service's role in this? Well, we, we're, we're responsible for overall uh, wildlife management on the island. We work on developing wildlife management plans, uh, the general plan that we've developed. We have plans for least turn management, cormorant management, disease response, and things like that. We do a lot of monitoring for wildlife. Uh, a lot of, we do wetland monitoring and SAV monitoring. And by the way, we're always looking for volunteers. Anybody wants to volunteer and come out with us, we have plenty of opportunities to come out. Um, we do a lot of predator and nuisance species surveillance and control, uh, habitat enhancement, we do, do disease response, and we also provide technical assistance to the Maryland uh, Environmental Service and to the Army Corps. With regards to avian monitoring, we have over 230 species documented on site right now. 30 plus nesting species, and that is, is confirmed, and we probably have closer to 36 to 40 species probable. We work really closely with uh, USGS, Patuxent and Wildlife Research, on the monitoring. Some of the species that we do some intense monitoring include the uh, least and common terns, which are state threatened in the state of Maryland. And we work a lot with snow egrets and a lot of osprey monitoring. And, uh, with regards to the osprey monitoring, you can see we have data from 2002 to 2018. You can see that upward trend on the number of deaths rising up. We had a little bit of a drop off here in 2016. If you recall, those were really wet maize that we had, cold and wet. That's the main incubation time for ospreys, and they just didn't do that well. The numbers just went down. But in 2018, conditions were ideal, and we had been a record year. And because of the intense osprey monitoring that we do do, we would do it once a week, we started an osprey foster program. I started in 2009. And uh, we work really closely with Tri-State Bird Rescue. I don't know if some of you may have heard of them. They're, they're an internationally renowned uh, oil spore response uh, group, do a lot of work around the world. Uh, and I've had a lot of experience working with them. And uh, they contacted us. They said they had some osprey chicks that had fallen out of a nest and they needed home to have any nest that we could put them in. Because of the data that we have from the avian monitoring work with ospreys, we know the exact age of every nest, actually to the day for each, for each chick that's in those nests. So we can take those chicks, age them, and then we know the appropriate nest that they can go to. So the handling time is minimized. We put them in those nests, and they do pretty well. We have a really high success rate, for, at least when they fledged. Uh, what happens after that, we're not sure. But we've done up to 40 chicks as of 2018. Another focal species for us are common terns and least terns. Uh, common terns are in green and yellow, least terns are in the yellow. And so we've got hatching successes on the right hand column and a uh, number of nests on the left. And as you can see, prior to 2015, we had some good hatching success, I mean, with good numbers. Uh, there was a depression in 2015. Anybody want to take a guess what happened in 2015? See if anybody's close, huh? 
I'll keep you in suspense for a couple more minutes. But anyhow, you can see the numbers are starting to rebound after the 2017-2018. Uh, that brings us to our predator and nuisance species surveillance and control. A number of species that we do work with, uh, we try to keep mammalian predators down, especially fox and things like that, raccoon. We don't really have any raccoon on site. We did have one, but not have any more. Muskrats were a big concern for the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they wanted us to take a lot of the, the rats out. We, we felt that they're an important part of the marsh ecosystems, so we just didn't want to randomly take as many as we could. So we developed a population model based on our foraging rates, uh, numbers of individuals per, uh, per hut unit and things like that. And we use uh, above ground and below ground biomass data from the University of Maryland. And we developed a population model. And we could develop a carrying capacity for each wetland cell. So when we do our surveys in the, in the winter, which we're actually doing right now, we can get an idea of how many are in each cell. If we exceed the carrying capacity, and that's the number that we'll call out of there. So winter 2014, extremely cold winter. We had ice 15, 16 inches thick from shore to shore in this part of the bay. It's also a great time to travel if you're a fox, right? So we've got a lot of sub-adults at that time of year trying to find new, new, ter new, new territories and to start their families. I found that animated GIF. I had to put that in there. So. But anyhow, we, did, we had seven foxes come out on the island. And, uh, they actually caused havoc in the, in the Turin colonies, for sure. Uh, when we got to the island in late February, we had a fresh snow and we saw prints and thought, well, maybe we had one out there. Well, we caught that one. And there was more prints showing up, more and more and more. So we finally got the last one, actually, in uh, Christmas 2017. No, 2000. 2017, right? And uh, that last one was very wary. I mean, he he knew what we were up to. It was unbelievable how smart this fox was. And that's what they say to They're sly, right? They, they know what they're doing. But uh, when we do do the uh, avian monitoring in the turn columns, we do mark all our nests. Uh, you can see right here, this is the least turn nest. We mark it with a stake. There's the least turn egg right there. And you can see the footprints right here. And you could just see each stake, footprint, footprint, footprint. And they just caused zero reproductive cess that one year. Uh, habitat enhancement, do a lot of work with that, providing technical assistance on what types of shrubs and things to plant. We also do some smaller plantings with, with some of our smaller groups and volunteers that we get. Do a lot of work with putting uh, nesting platforms out, such as uh, osprey platforms, nest boxes. We work really closely with some of the scout groups, Girl Scouts and Voice groups. They're always looking for projects. So what we'll typically do is work with them in the, in the late fall. They'll come to our office and we'll start building boxes. And then at the end of the school year, they, they get to come out and put them in the, into the marsh. Another program that we work with is developing uh, what we'll call brush piles into the marshes, in the high areas of the marsh. And we've worked with uh, Eastern Public Works. They'll drop off Christmas trees to us. And actually, we just got a bunch dropped off last week. So we create these small brush piles in the high marsh areas and it provides cover for black duck. Uh, we get a lot of passerines using them, uh, a lot of small mammals, white footed mice, meadow voles, and things like that. All, you know, all, all prey source for some of the raptors and stuff that we have out there. I don't know if any of you, do you know Eileen Sobeck? Is everybody here from DOI? This is Eileen Sobeck's mom. She was, yet, she was uh, I guess, acting assistant secretary for Fish and Wildlife. And uh, we do a lot of work with volunteers, and she was helping us paint our decoys that we had to make for the, uh, for the Turin colonies. One of the big issues for the site is that uh, because it's an active construction site and there's a lot of material being moved around on the island. We need to keep the turns out of where they're actively putting sand. And that's been a challenge, but we've been pretty successful relocating. And what we do is we use decoys and we use call boxes. And we've been highly successful in attracting birds to an area where they're, minim where they're not going to be disturbed and still allow for construction activities to go on. Because 
anything when it comes with marine contractors, it's, it's an expensive endeavor for sure. So as of 2018, we, had, we used 51 volunteers last year, which amounted to over 1,200 hours. And uh, you, know, you see these guys on the bottom here. Uh, they don't start out the day that way, but at the end of the day, they're pretty tired. In fact, this young man right here, he started with us when he was eight years old. He's now uh, going to the high school. And he's, he's been a pretty dedicated volunteer. He's, he's got a passion for, uh, for wildlife and conservation. He's already got his you know, school plan that's going to go to the Naval Academy and all that stuff. So he's got a good plan. Uh, wildlife disease response is another one big thing for us. Uh, 2012, we had a big algal bloom and uh, also coincided with an avian botulism event. So obviously we got to make sure that we don't have dead birds or sick birds on the island. We get a lot of tours out there. So it, it made for a pretty busy summer. I mean, we were out there for 15 weeks collecting sick and dead birds. Uh, some of the diseases yeah, there, they have been documented out there. Avian botulism was by far probably the most numerous one. 2012, like I said, that was a real big one for us. But it still wasn't big compared when you look at the, the events that occur out west where you get sometimes millions of birds affected. I think we had over 1,000 birds at that, in this particular event. New duck disease. Salmonellosis is another one that I would think avian botulism and salmonellosis is the, are the two most common ones. Uh, Aspergillosis, which is a fungal disease, uh, avian paramyxovirus. This is kind of an interesting one because this can gets into a poultry house that can be devastating. So we have to make sure. It usually affects the cormorants, but we know we're, up, we're pretty close to the eastern shore. So there's a lot of poultry houses on the eastern shore. So we have to make sure that we can we pick up any dead or sick birds and remove them immediately because once it gets into a poultry house, that whole flock has to be euthanized, and that's pretty expensive. We've had some cases of West Nile virus out there. Another interesting disease that we're seeing, and it seems that the Annapolis, Poplar Island area is a hot spot for a disease called steatitis, and I have, I'll show you a little bit. But uh, it's a disease where it's related to oxidative stress, where in captive animals, animals that fed in diets high in fish, polyunsaturated fats, they have a hard time dealing with the uh, lipid in it oxidizes in their system. It forms these really hard fat deposits around the internal organs. And uh, they know if you treat, you can, might be able to treat them with some antioxidants, vitamin E and selenium and like that, but it's, it's not really that effective. But interestingly, we've been doing some work with blue-green algal toxins, cyanotoxins, and we have found that there could be a relationship there too, because the birds that we have found with steatitis majority also have uh, documented exposure to some of these cyanotoxins, microcystins specifically. Now this is this is just a shot showing you this is a steatitic bird. You see this hard fat just encases the organs. The birds, there's no real rehabilitation for them. Uh, they, they're really lethargic and they typically have to be euthanized. And this is a, a reference bird from Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. You see the big difference. Like I said, you know, 2012 we had a naive and botulism event ongoing with an algal toxin event. And uh, we did send some samples out and they, and they came back positive for both uh, microcystins and uh, avian botulism. So there's some thought that algal blooms may trigger an avian botulism event. It's kind of an interesting uh, disease. Uh, so uh, uh, avian botulism is a bacterial disease related disease. And the spores can be found in marsh sediments and things like that. So a lot of dabbling dogs that are ingesting these sediments, they can get into the tissues. Well, the environmental conditions have to be perfect. So you may get a few birds that die, maybe associated with a, you know, an algal event, algal toxin event. So they need anaerobic conditions to generate, they need a protein source, and they also need warm conditions. So a dead carcass in the summertime is perfect conditions. So what happens is, it's called a maggot cycle. Lo-fi's come in, they'll feed on the, uh, on the carcass, ingest the toxins, 
those maggots now have the toxins, other birds will feed on those maggots and the cycle perpetuates itself. So it's essential in uh, collecting as many of those carcasses as you possibly can. One other thing that we work on is wetland monitoring. We look at uh, aerial coverage by species. We use an adaptive management plan approach. And um, there are targets where the plants have to meet within five years for uh, like coverage is one of them, looking at stem heights and measuring species diversity. And we compare those to reference, nearby reference sites. Uh, this is a slide showing the marsh restoration progression in May before planting takes place. And you can see through the seasons, by the end of October, you've got some pretty good growth in there. And one of the things we learned that, you know, we used an adaptive management approach. They were fertilizing these plants when they were putting them in the ground. Well, there's really no need to. Those, marsh, those sediments that were coming in are loaded with nutrients. There's no need to, to fertilize. So we don't fertilize anymore. We have Spartina alternative flora that's seven to eight feet tall. And if you know anything about that particular grass, it usually doesn't get that tall. I mean, if you're in a marsh, it's probably about this tall at the max. The problem is, it's so much nutrients, it's all going into above ground biomass. So if the cane's falling down, and you get some dead areas. It usually takes about two to three years before you get some pretty luxurious growth and the, the, the uh, nutrients start to diminish. Also, same thing with uh, submerged aquatic vegetation monitoring. We do that three times a year in the, in the, in the warmer parts of the year. And uh, we're getting some pretty good growth in the uh, Poplar Harbor, which is where we're trying to establish you know, those suitable conditions for growth. It's not doing as well as our reference sites. Last year, we had a really good year. And the year before that, was, it was pretty profound how, how much SAV we were getting. But the fact is, we're getting growth in there, and I expect it to probably get better as, as the uh, time progresses. And then that is it. So I'll take any questions you have, and uh, feel free. I mean, I'll get my contact information. If you guys have some spare time, want to come out to a site visit, sure.